All right, we're here with Simon. Um, Simon, you're uh, the way that I know you is through the the Gavin Watson books. Um, I think it's Skins, and there was one right after that too, right? Um, but yeah, anyway, he's, he's put out about four or five books. I think there was Skins and Punks, and right, yeah, about three or four of them. Yeah, yeah. So that's how. Uh, that's how I first uh, saw you, and then I actually met you uh, many years ago. Uh, Indecent Exposure was playing a show in the Boston area. Oh, right. yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I talked to you briefly then. Uh, but, uh, Ill, right? I was really ill. I remember we'd been, we'd been out, we'd been in America for about a week, and uh, been to various cities, and when we got to Boston, I felt really rough, so I sat in the van most of the night, yeah. <laughs> uh hungover i suppose yeah i think i think it was just too much on the road you know like not eating properly and drinking too much and things like that you know it's very difficult when you're touring because um you have to live on you know late night takeaways or what you quote to go or whatever um and you just live on shit food basically so i was just feeling a bit rough yeah sure sure yeah um yeah the uh the convenience factor is great but the the quality of the food is not so oh, great. Oh, Dunkin' um, Donuts and stuff like that, you know, at night, it's just got oh, terrible. It's bad enough here with kebabs and things, but over in America, it's even much worse. You just oh, can't yeah. eat at night at all, any sort of nutrients. Uh, at least uh, over there, they've banned a lot of the really harmful chemicals and stuff that they've put in the food here. <laughs> I, remember, but, uh, I, remember, I remember one day on that tour... I I just so had enough of just junk food. I said, right, let's go and find some salad and some vegetables. And um, we just couldn't find any. And we eventually we drove onto this sort of industrial park, and there was a supermarket there, and it had vegetables and fruit. And we bought some. It's like wow, we got some nutrients. I think Milky even mentioned that on stage <laughs> that night. I think he might have actually been in Boston. He know he mentioned that because we were all just like you could just feel toxic. You know, we started yeah, absolutely. Eating, we started in Allentown on that tour. Uh, it's like an oi festival. And then we went to, um, I can't remember now, but about maybe four cities, I think. And then we ended up, I think, yeah, Boston, I think might have been the last one. I can't remember. It's a long time ago now. It's probably about, oh, that was probably about 12 years ago or more now, wasn't it? So, yeah, it must, it had to have been. Um, I, are you, you're like a tour manager. Is that what, is that what you yeah, do full time? Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't tour managing on that one. I was just, <laughs> I just, I, I've known Milky a long time, and um, he was going to America and with the foreskins and all them. So I said, oh, I'll come along, you know, and help out and all that. So that's what I did. It was more for fun, really, from my point of view. And um, yeah, I, I did enjoy it. It was good fun. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, um, and you, you and I, I mean, you had sent me probably if not before around the same time I had had one like email correspondence with you one or two where you sent me a couple really long messages about like talking all about um, your experience um, in the, you know, skinhead subculture when you were younger, mm -hmm. kind of yeah. around the time that uh, the, all those photographs and skins was shot. But um, yeah. I, what I wanted to ask, I wanted to get like, your input on a few questions that I have. Um, the the whole point of this new series that I'm doing for my channel called Deconstructing Subculture is basically I want to um, I want to find out what people how people determine what a, a member of a subculture is or like what a subculture is exactly and 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 what the sort of criteria are for being part of that culture, because I think it's an interesting phenomenon. I also want to shed light on the fact that, well, something like uh, skinhead subculture for me was one of the first introductions to the idea that um, the media spins things and nothing is really what it seems. And there's like a lot of nuance to things that people don't think about, um, that people oversimplify you know, uh, our, our history, um, whatever it might be. And, and nothing's really black and white. Right. Yeah, so, of um, I guess my first question for you is 
uh, in your opinion, what is a skinhead? Well, I mean, um, it's a difficult thing. It's a, it's a, like you say, it's a subculture. It's a tribal subculture, um, and it's changed a lot over the years. I mean, it's it's an ongoing organic movement and change. You can't ever, you can't really put it into any one box. Uh, we did a documentary in uh, in the early nineties, and in fact, it was it was an American bloke who said um, on it, you know, ask five skinheads what they think a skinhead is and you'll get 20 different answers. And, and he was actually right because they, it changes constantly, you know, and I think as you grow older, so your, um, you know, your thoughts and your way of life changes with your age, you know, and your experiences in life. But I mean, for me, you have to take it right back to when I began. I mean, it began before I was involved, but I got involved in, in 1978 because it was that era. It was that, age really from leaving um primary school moving on to secondary school i don't know what you'd call that in america but that's basically in this country you have two schools a young school and an old school you know you call it high school don't you but it was that that change between um you know being a kid and being a teenager and in the 70s the late 70s it was vitally important to be involved in a subculture because it was a protection thing it was being part of the pack um, and, you know, it, it was very much based on the style of music you liked, um, the clothing you wore, the friends, the class system in England, which was very um, powerful then, you know, middle class and working class. And, you know, it was the era of punk. So punk was um, all about freedom and, and self-expression. I loved the whole punk ideal, um, but I didn't feel comfortable as punk because it was a bit too dress up because you got thinking at that time it was still sort of it was quite high fashion being a punk um and a bit bit pretentious but when it hit the council estates where i came from which is what you'd call the projects it became real you know it was a it was a working class thing it, it was a, i suppose the way to really sort of compare it is a little bit like if you think of america when you had like the irish gangs the italian gangs the hispanic gangs it was that type of thing it was very much um related to where you came from and where you grew up um and for me it was it was very british it was very working class it was very us and, and no one had touched it because it was quite violent it was quite um you couldn't just become a skinhead you couldn't just cut your hair and that's it you're a skinhead people tried that but to be a real skinhead you had to have the physical ability as well as a certain mentality to 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 survive it you know and be accepted so um yeah what, that, what would be what were what would some of the authentication processes be well i mean i think you know we all grew up together in the same area so we all knew each other you know we were the bad boys you know we were the kids we were the kids in class that you know gave the teachers a lot of lip and um were very anti-authority and uh, we had this sort of aggressive sort of cheek about ourselves you know where we were yeah so you had to to be a skinhead be accepted properly you, you were that type of kid you know so when you went to you know you'd never grass that was a big thing you know like um i don't know what, what you call it snitching you know no, you'd never a snitch you know if you were ever a snitch you couldn't be a skinhead you know it was little things like that as a kid um and you you know we were all sort of we were the rogues you know we were the uncool and um yeah, so, I mean, loads of kids got their heads shaved when Two-Tone came along um, and wore the clothes. But there was a difference between fashion and becoming a way of life type thing, which is a bit of a cliche saying, but that was really all part of it. Yeah. So, like, basically, uh, it was a lot of, like, whether someone was accepted it was based on, like, whether the whole the whole gang accepted it, but that could vary from, uh, I guess, different areas that you were in, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, it was, a, it was a sort of street family, really. I, um, and I think each person had their own sort of part of, of, that, of that family unit. You know, there were comedians, there were carers, there were the violent ones, there were the leaders, there were the followers. Um, and we all sort of fitted into our part. And, um, you know, and it was quite a violent era as well. So because of the violence, you had to you had to know that those people had your back and you had theirs. There was no you're never running away. And that was a big part of it, that um, if, if, if you got into a tear up with another mob, um, 
and you ran away. That was the last time you were ever seen. That was it. Out. You know, so there was that element to it as well. Um, yeah, but it was different. I mean, in different areas, you know, there probably wasn't such a violent place. Where I lived was quite a violent place. So that was all part of all part of it. So, yeah, you know, when we ended up in police cells and uh, we quite often um, get to the point where, you know, if you were being charged with something that you hadn't done, but your mate had, you took the rap for him, you know, because that was part of it. And if, if and that was just expected, you know, we, we, we had that loyalty to each other. That was a very big part of it. Have you ever spent any time in, in jail due to skinhead violence? Um, not in full jail. I mean, I've spent plenty of times in cells. Um, I never got guilted. Um, you know, a few times it was very close, very, very close. Um, but you know, we, we would always, we would never say anything. We'd never open up. We'd never, you know, admit to anything. And generally, you know, if they had no proof, they'd let you go. And it was minor stuff, really. It was all just street fighting and there was nothing too serious, really. Looking back, we thought we were big serious, but it was just to tear up in a pub with blokes who were just as up for it as we were. So, and they'd never go against us in court. We'd never go against them in court. So nine out of 10 times we walked away with, with a small fine and a slap on the wrist. You know, it wasn't, it was not, it was not really serious stuff, really, when you look back on it. You know, the worst thing that ever happened to you was a broken nose or a couple of missing knuckles or whatever, you know. It was that sort of stuff. It was just, you know, young young lads, really, uh, trying to prove prove themselves, you know. Yeah, it's a lot different here nowadays. You get charged real quick. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, they take, it, they take it so seriously in different parts of America. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so what a... Um, what are some of the, the negative, other than just the violent aspect, which is basically uh, probably just a, a truth of the subculture, what are some of the negative stigmas uh, about skinheads that like the media portrays and, and why do you think that that is? Well, I mean, the, 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 I've always I often say this, right? If you If you save 10 people's lives, you'll get three lines in the newspaper. If you kill 10 people, they'll write a book about you and they'll make a film about you. And that is really it. They like titillation. They like, you know, they like to have an antichrist. They like to have somebody that they can blame and, and be the enemy. You know, in the old days of the Westerns, it was like cowboys and Indians. You know, it was, um, you know, and, and we are the Indians and the cowboys. And that's that's sort of how it is. And And as a working class lad, we had no defence because nobody would ever stand up against us. We weren't a minority that had any form of protection. The only protection we had was ourselves and we weren't particularly educated. Um, we were easily manipulated. Um, so therefore we were cannon fodder for, for the media and the press. And, and so they, they developed a, 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 an ogre, which we played up to, you know, we like being the bad boy. We like getting ourselves in the newspaper, you know, for being stupid. And so, um, the media got away with it and so they could make films and then when that went abroad um, you know films like American History X and Romper Stomper and those films that were made um, kids around the world looked at that and thought oh yeah I want to be one of them you know that's what mm -hmm. they are to be like that commit that what's it written on fucking Hollywood so they became that and then it perpetuated so it was like Self-fulfilling prophecy. Copy of the film, and then it became a reality. Whereas we were something different. We were before those films. You know, they were mm. they were based loosely on us, but they were only on a, a, a small minority of us. We weren't organised gangs. We weren't. You know, we were just street urchins. Really, there was no. You know, I mean, we're stupid looking back. We never made any money out of it. We weren't like Italian, uh, you know, mafia that sort of had a gang that that became a business. We weren't that. We just liked to tear up. We we're like football hooligans. We go and have a fight on a Saturday, and we'd be working with the same guys on Monday. So there was no mm -hmm. dislike. It was just an adrenaline thing that we were into. And the media, you know, I mean, I, I hate even talking about the fucking subject. It drives me mad. But this whole racial thing that the the media is obsessed with, and even to this day is obsessed with, um, it was built by them. They were the ones that created that. They were the ones that sold that story. And so as it was picked up around the world, people thought that's what you're meant to be. So they they, they joined that and it, and, it, and it fed it. It was like the media sold newspapers, the, the extremist groups earned money, um, and we became the, the fodder, the foot soldiers for it, you know. So 
as we grew older, um, you know, you're talking about we're 14 year old kids and we were, we were too young to vote, but we were being used by these these extremist groups. And there was the left wing and the right wing both trying to, to get us. And the whole philosophy they had was to create chaos. If you create chaos, um, you break a system and out of the system becomes a new new rising, like a phoenix rising from the dust ashes, you know, and they learn it all from Hitler and from Stalin, you know, the, the you know, the Bolsheviks and the, and the Nazis, you know, so that was where they were trying to, um, that was the model they were trying to use. And we were, the, were meant to be these, <laughs> you know, people that were going to create a revolution, you know, I mean, you got to think in England, it was a dangerous time then because it was an em end of an empire. Um, you know, we had an empire for 400 years. So um, my father and the people of that generation were born in the war and just before the war so they grown through that their their parents were you know soldiers of the empire so in the 1960s there was a big boom um there was a lot of money in england because everything was being sold off by the 70s there was a massive massive depression and out of that depression came the subcultures came the extremism because they had there was fuel there was something they could bite onto you know if you look at the wall street crash that's what created hitler because he, that gave him his golden ticket The, you know the world economy was destroyed so people were looking for a savior and so when there's a big depression that's when you get extremism and that's when it becomes an alternative to the system that we're living in you know it's, so, it goes on today you know look at the look at the um you know, the, the, the ISIS and people, you know, they're being picked up because they're feeling deprived, they're being destroyed. So therefore they they gain up and they fight. And it was it was a very minor version of that, really. So, um, you know, because uh, just for the viewers who don't know, um, you know, Skinhead was a very multicultural subculture uh, that stems from a mix of different cultures like Jamaican culture and even uh, American and um, and English, uh, you know, American in terms of some of the clothes maybe, but like uh, mostly English and Jamaican, right? So there was also uh, black skinheads and uh, or just people that I identified as skinheads, maybe from a few different racial backgrounds. Well, yeah. So even since the beginning, as far as I'm on my understanding, uh, so the question is like, why, why do you think it, it leans more uh, one way than the other? Like, how did it get co-opted as a to be to be thought of as a right wing white supremacist uh, sort of subculture more than a black subculture? Because it's how there was like an even split. Well, because because the black people um, believed the media as much as the white people did. So, you know, I had a lot of black friends. I mean, I grew up in a very, very multicultural area. I mean, my, my estate, we had a, a St. Vincent. Um, it was people from St. Vincent, lots of people from my next door neighbours, all the people directly opposite are all from St. Vincent. I grew up with that my entire life, literally from the age of three or four years old you know, when they first arrived and you know, I remember the shock in my and my dad you know that, that, that there was immigrants coming in because this was new to England but my children my childhood friends were all, were all the West Indian kids who grew up together so um you know the so, whole you know, look what, like why 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 did it not become like why did the media not spin it more more towards uh like black power rather than towards white power well, I mean, it because it was a sort of tribal. It was like I say, it was a manipulation of the of the, of the right wing um, political groups. Because the thing is, they it, it's, it sounds strange now, really, to to look at it. But we were very patriotic, right? We 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 were like the soldiers of the British Empire. That was over, right? We had a massive unemployment, and so the thing to blame was was immigration because you had three million immigrants and three million un unemployed. So get rid of the three million immigrants, everyone's in work. That was a sort of simple term of what it was. So there was, and the tribalism, they picked up on the tribalism and divided us up. So in my area, um, the right wing thing didn't really exist. I mean, yeah, there was one or two people would say they were, but it didn't exist because we were, we were very multicultural. So it couldn't be because these are our real friends. So it wasn't, I mean, yeah, you might play the part for the media, but in reality, 
we were best of friends and we still are. I mean, to this day, my my mates are mates I grew up with. I'm still very much close to I mean, I'm my my kids are friends with their kids. You know, we've we've grown up together. So it really didn't exist. And this whole um right wing extremism thing that the media are obsessed on, it, it was very, very small part. You know, because up in the north and and in a lot of these areas where these so called right wing extremists came from. Most of them grew up in solid white areas. They didn't even know a black person. So wow, they can be racist towards people they've never met. It's just mm -hmm. ridiculous because they were believing. The same as when they went to America, they were believing the media. They were going, right, okay, that's what we've got to do. We've got to wear a swastika T-shirt and be all that because that's what the media tell us. They, they had no connection to us in the real world. And the music, I mean, you've got to go right back to the early days. My mum was a first-generation mod, right, in, in the 1950s. And the music they were into was modern jazz, R&B, blues, soul. It was the music that was coming out of America. The American GIs were bringing this black music over to England. And this is in conservative England where we didn't really have many black people then. And it was really underground and it was really cool because this was something quite different to the sort of BBC world that my mum was living in. So people like Miles Davis, my mum was a massive Miles Davis fan, you know. So those early mods, that's what they were picking up. Um, and the clothing, like you mentioned earlier, was w w had had the American um, thing because you got to think England was devastated in the 1950s. England was devastated. There'd been a Second World War. We, our country had been bombed completely. So you know nobody had anything. We had no food. So my mum and her friends used to see the Hollywood films and they would make the clothes to look like the people on the screen. You know, America had it all. They'd taken the world then because the work the Second World War had destroyed um, Europe. Um, and America took the spoils of war. They weren't attacked. You know, they lost a lot of boys they sent over to die, but it didn't really affect the country. You know, you lost a lot of, you know, working class American boys that went over and, and died at D-Day. And, uh, you know, brave boys they were, but it didn't really affect them. Hollywood was booming. You know, America made a fortune out of the Second World War. I mean, really did. You, the more you look at it, the more they made, you know, out of it. So you've got to think in England, they had nothing. So they were looking at these Hollywood films and say, God, they're really cool. Look at the way they dress. Look at the clothes. Look at the, the cars they drive. So that was modernism. These kids were looking at that and thinking, right, that's what I want to be. So the black music that was coming in was this underground black music, which in, in America wasn't really getting any um, airplay because America was very, very, um, what's the word for it? You know, uh, conservative. Segregated. You know, they, they didn't play black music on radios, only in certain like maybe a jazz FM, like jazz radio station. But generally... Elvis Presley made rock and roll. You know, it was a black music, but Elvis Presley made rock and roll, you know. Um, but in England, black music was accepted and thought of as really cool. So that was those first generation mods in the 50s. Then by the 60s, the West Indians, the Caribbean, started coming to England. And with that brought the next generation of black music, which coincided with, with, with the next generation of subcultures, which were the skinheads. So they were picking up ska and reggae and 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 the motown sound and everything um so that early reggae music and and the styles you know that because it was the um ivy league stuff that's what everybody was into this cool ivy league you know the button down shirts and the you know the big big checks and all this sort of stuff it was all really really modern and really cool you know i've got loads of loads of these shirts that i've got a whole load of them. this is a sort of um a brutus shirt you know and, and that's um that's, that's the sort of thing we wear you know it's all sort of very loud colors and stylish and you know main thing is you've got your three three fingers that go in the collar you know and, and that's the sort of stuff we all wear and it's all sort of um stylish and and you also got to think that later on in the late 60s you had um things like the man on the moon you know america going to the moon so you know the skinhead moon stomp was written about that you know oh the skinheads are going to jump on the moon you know it was all about that because that was what was in the news at that time so it was all it was all sort of fantasy world and it was all exciting, this whole new world that, that, that we were living in. I was too young for that. But I came 10 years later where there'd been a massive depression in the 70s. So the, the glory days were gone. You know, Britain was at, was at war with itself. There were strikes everywhere. There was a three day working week. There was there was chaos. People didn't have food. You know, we were all all poverty stricken because there was nothing and no work. So we were all and, the, and our parents were angry because they'd lived through the war. They'd lived through the 60s boom and then they were had children in the 70s when there was nothing. So punk came along and punk was fuck the system, you know, destroy the class system. You know, it was angry. 
Um, but it but it was it was also fashion orientated when and the skinheads came off the back of that, the second generation of skinheads, and we meant it. We were going to destroy the system physically, you know. Um, and so that anger and aggression and on the football terraces, it was seen every Saturday. It was it was warfare. But it it wasn't it was a funny thing because it wasn't hatred towards another working class kid. It was just about being angry and being aggressive. The enemy was the working, there was the middle class, you know, and the, and the ruling elite, the, you know, the establishment. Um, so yeah, that that that's where it all all went, you know, and and the manipulation um, was like, you know, oh, you know, white power, you know, it's you know, you stand stand strong as a white person and get rid of the black people, and therefore you're going to get powerful again. So they manipulated us away from the real enemy into fighting ourselves. And and this is this is what what they always do. They do it today, you know. I mean, look at America. You've got the Hispanic areas, the black areas, the white areas. They divide people. When these people are all the same, they're all working in the same environment. They're all having children. They're all worrying about their health and all the rest of it, same as we were. But we were manipulated to find an enemy and take that take it away from the real enemy, which was the powers. Like today, it's the corporate powers, you know. Then it was um, it was still the establishment, you know. And as a young person with no education you're just angry and you'll you'll smash anybody you know and the, and the songs that were being written and made at the time we were listening to that and thinking yeah that's the enemy let's go and fight them but the, the, the racial thing was 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 minor it was nothing i mean i we fought all the time every weekend and i mean in that whole time i mean i i can count on one hand less than one hand you know the, the times we fought with black gangs because yeah there were black gangs and there was areas and there was asian gangs but we had a sort of respect for each other, you know, although we weren't necessarily all interlinked, we were, we were tribal. We had a respect for each other, you know? So yeah, it, it's, it's blown out of all proportion, really. Believe me. Absolutely. Did you ever sustain any like serious injuries um, that like made you kind of question whether you should like continue? Uh, Cause you always hear like, sometimes you hear those stories of people fighting and like, you know, someone gets punched in the face falls backward hits their head and they die yeah. you know like i mean i think personally i never i never sustained any but um i was responsible for one or two and i think that changed me you know when when things got to another level um you have to question yourself because you either think well you know what seemed important for that 10 minutes you know is is, is affected people for the rest of their life you have to question yourself unless you're a psychopath and I'm not a psychopath. So right. when I saw some of the damage that, that that was caused in some of these fights, you know, yeah, of course I did. And that's, that did change me. Of course it did. But I grew up, I was growing up you know, I was becoming a father. So, right. you know, I had, to, I had to make a decision. What do I want to spend 10, 15 years in jail for a fucking silly pub fight? Or do I want to become a father? You know, and you wear it up and you, you go in the sensible thing. And that's how it was. Some people didn't, a lot of my friends, you know, well, not a lot of them, but a good few, they didn't change. So therefore, they're not here anymore. They're dead. You know, they 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 went too far, and um, most of them are dead. You know, they they either died through violence or got into drug addiction and self abuse and and died. You know, and it's terrible. I lost a lot of friends that way. You know, um, but yeah. it wasn't. You know, it was it was cool at the time. You know, we liked the adrenaline rush and we thought we were heroes. But when you grow up and you look at it and you actually question yourself you know when it gets a bit too nasty and so you know it became i walked away from it really that's what was the end of it for me you know it just got to a point and i just thought where are you going to go with this it's just going to go further and then you know the old no, it was like i i got like a pretty serious um like i got my nose broken in mm -hmm. a fight you know in high school and like that that state like the damage that was sustained from that mm. lasted so many years i had to get eventually i had to get like surgery to correct mm. everything and it's like and then i i had even like done some some really terrible like violent shit that was super cowardly you know yeah. and like i just the reason i ask is like i always in my mind go back to the, those times and i i wish i could find that person and like say that i'm sorry you know and just like actually hug them you know yeah. and like f i felt like what i did was so wrong yeah you know? and i don't know i mean I, I guess it's just part of growing up but um 
yeah, you know, I that stuff that 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 still kind of haunts me. Um, yeah. You know, so I see, just, I, I, I was I was never a bully, never a bully. I hated yeah. bullying. Um, and uh, I mean, the violence that we were involved, it was, you know, it was just other little mobs and they would do the same to us as what we do to them. So it was it was like a boxing match, you know, in a way like a bare knuckles boxing match. You know, you're both in it. The winner wins, the loser loses, you know, and it was just that as things got more progressive and we got better at it. So therefore, it, people got a lot more hurt than they than they did in the early days, you know. Mm. Um, but I mean, I do feel guilt to a certain degree, one or two. Um, but you know, if it hadn't been them, it would have been me, sort of thing, you know. So I can't. Yeah, I mean, if if I if I could change it, if I if I could say right, we shouldn't. If we weren't there that day, then that would be better. But we were, and it happened. So that was that. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was boys. You know, it's like top dog thing you know they want to be the top dog we want to be the top dog so you fought until someone won and that's right. you know realistically generally it was us that won because we, we were doing it a lot whereas they were just doing it every now and again you know so yeah so Bill, um, i suppose there's an element but not massively really you know, so sound, um yeah so skinhead is considered like a working class subculture right so what did you uh think of people that came in from like uh the middle class or upper class that were like trying to emulate that style or hang out and you know wanted to fit in well it, it, it never happened when i was young it just didn't um they, they just weren't but mm-hmm. in later years when i've traveled around the world I, I found that amazing actually you know nowadays i know skin into a doctors and lawyers and architects and things like that you know and i find that amazing i mean i was in columbia you know like a few months ago and there's some beautiful skinhead girls there that are you know like they're studying and got degrees and they're really educated and really middle class and like to me i find it's fucking amazing because we were the we had no education i left school with not a single examination result nothing and none of my mates did we worked on building sites laying bricks you know, we were the labourers and the, you know, the construction workers and stuff. You know, we had no education. And what I do you think the, the appeal is for, like, for uh, people that come from those backgrounds that sort of idealise the working class, but they're not? Well, I think it's that every, every you know, a lot of people want to belong, don't they? And I think that I find it quite sad, actually. I mean, my some of my family now, you know, my sister and my nieces and stuff, they're quite middle class, you know, and... I look at them and I see their teenage years and how they are with their friends and and they just don't have that that belonging we had, you know. And I think that's what perhaps these middle class lot who come in and, and play play the part for a while, um, they're looking to belong. They they like the style, they like the cool, they like the um the rebelliousness of it as a sort of dress up. Um, very few have the same psychology that we had because they come from a different background. They come from from having and not and not from having not you know and i don't want to sound like oh poor us but it is a different psychology that they've got um i don't think it's a bad thing when i when i first got back because i went out the scene for you know a good time because my children and traveled the world and did lots of things and then i slipped back into it um for some unknown reason um and i was going abroad going out to germany and scandinavia and usa and places and meeting all these now skinners and they weren't violent they were looking really cool. They had the tattoos and looked the part. And they were cool as fuck, you know. And I thought, this is really strange because they look like us, but they don't act like us. You know, there's a difference. They want to be something, but they, uh, it's different. They would never have been accepted when we were young. <laughs> We'd have laughed at them, you know, because yeah. they looked really cool, but they just didn't have what, what we had, you know. And uh, I, yeah, I found it quite amusing. But now I like it. I think it's good. It's changed. They have changed it. They, they've, they've, they've moved it on to where we were. We had a very negative thing. We self destroyed ourselves. They haven't. They've, they've moved. So you on. see it. You see it as a positive in a in a way. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think it's. I you know I, what I find absolutely amazing now is how it's gone around the world. I mean, like I said, I've been to Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, you know, yeah, Indonesia's got a, a really cool scene. Oh, they really have. Brazil, Colombia. You know, I mean, they've got a really really cool scene there, and, it, and they and they're coming out. But there's a connection. This is what I really like: is the connection. They've listened to the songs. They've picked up on the style. They've seen Gavin's old pictures, and 
and they've connected to it. And, and that I find fascinating and amazing. And, and it's a new generation. And this is um, why I, 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 I find it bizarre now how the media are still harking on, you know, calling skinhead something they're not. Because if you go to you go to um, Malaysia, you're going to meet a load of Muslim skinheads you know, that go to church on a, is it Friday prayers? You know, they they on a Friday they go, they put their Muslim gear on and go to church. You know, yeah, yeah. It's I know, actually I follow true. like some true. of those. those and uh, they laugh about it. You know, I've met lots of them and they laugh about that. You know, they're all tough guys. You then on a Friday they go to prayers. You know, and I think that's fantastic. And then uh, you know, like I say in South America they've they've got the sort of romance of it and and the coolness of it. You know. Uh, that is very violent because they're the, again they've they've picked up on the negative of it all. And I've I often when I go to places and I and I meet the local skinheads, I'll always tell them I say, look, it's negative because nobody in the real world gives a fuck about skinheads apart from other skinheads. So why destroy each other? Why be in this left wing camp or that right wing camp? It's bullshit because the only people you're attacking is each other because nobody in the rest of the world don't give a fuck. They want you divided. It's just nonsense. And it's destroyed the scene. It's not destroyed anybody else. They've never caused a revolution. All they've done is destroyed themselves and, and what they've got. And I know now of my age, as I've grown older, how important it is. Because although I've traveled the world and done a lot of different things, um, my old friends from my my teenage years, you know, they're my blood brothers. You know, I can trust them 100%. You know, I'll give you an example. We went to a Blondie gig the other week. My couple of my old mates from Wickham came down, my old skinhead mates. And I was with like one of my new friends. And um, my mate was going to the bar and I just gave him my bank card. I said, I'll go to the bar and, you know, get, get us a beer. And my mate said, what are you, you giving that guy? You'll cut your bank card. I said, well, one of my old scared mates. There's no way that guy is going to take a penny off me. And absolutely, you trust them with your life. You know, we've been through more than you could ever even talk about. And I can absolutely, I could live in my house, I could live in their house. And they know that we have 100% trust because, you know, we've been there. And that's, to me, is the value of it. And I think... These kids that are trying to get into this scene and then destroy it, that's the bit they're going to miss because the loyalty you get when you're a teenager lasts forever, you know, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I was in, you know, part of the reason I asked because I was like, I was, now I consider myself like that I would, or I can, I consider who I was back then as like a poser because yeah. I did come from that upper middle class background. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like pretty fortunate that uh, a lot of those working class kids did accept me. And um, so, what was the what was the appeal to you as a middle class kid to get involved in that? I, I think I was really insecure. Right. I, I really wanted to be accepted. I was bullied a lot, yeah. and uh, I really liked the idea of, of looking tough and feeling like I had like uh, a gang to back me up. Mm. You know. Um, and I was just embarrassed of being uh, a rich kid. Uh, right. That it was, I mean, even at, at, you know, having nothing to do with skinhead, um, living in the, you know, any anyone that was considered really cool, I guess, in um, you know, in the city in Boston, which you know would take the train to go to go into the city. Or in the suburbs surrounding the town that I was from, if you were like a rich kid, no one like, uh, I guess like, especially in music scenes, no one really uh, respected you as much. Yeah, you know, it was just not cool. Um, I have a fr I had a friend who grew up in England uh, during you know late sixties, early seventies. She said she was, you know, her, she was like me. Her parents were sort of middle class or upper middle class artsy people but she went to school at notting hill gate mm. and she wanted you know so to fit in she you know dressed like a skinhead mm. but her dad was all like spiritual and stuff and taught her to be a pacifist and one day she was at school and they were picking on her and pushing around and she said i'm a pacifist and they said what the fuck's a pacifist and they punched <laughs> her in the face <laughs> you know uh, so, you know, it was cool. I think it was a good experience for me though. Overall, like, uh, I definitely got a lot out of it. I certainly would not necessarily identify, you know, any, any, as any 
subcultural label at this point, but I still find it all fascinating and I find it, uh, it's still my number one, like interest is skinhead reggae and, and, you know, Ivy league style clothing. And, uh, you know, one of the questions I, I had for you was what do you think the diff cause skinhead started in like the late sixties, mid to late sixties, um, in England. And like you were saying, it's kind of, uh, if there's like a little bit of a difference between that period, the period where you got into it and then uh, later or now, what do you think the main difference is? Okay. Actually, let me reformulate. Uh, let me rethink about the re sorry. Let me think about this question for a second. What do you think the difference is between the kids that got into it back in the early days in the sixties versus your era and versus now i think you kind of covered it a little bit but like what do you think the difference is that would have made someone want to be a skinhead in the 60s versus you know later on well i mean i think as i said earlier that the the 60s it was a it was a boom time it was it was very much you know you got you got to think there's been the second world war and so i think people then generally didn't want to be held back into their class and just be be slaves to the system so those kids in the 60s were making a change they were wearing clothes so that's why they were wearing really good quality clothing it was to fuck the class system off because they were expected to wear working class you know flat caps and you know industrial clothing and they were wearing really cool italian suits and ivy league shirts and bro you know top handmade english brogues and 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 doc martins at the time were the new thing you know and, and this is this was all top brand stuff it wasn't you know they would save up for weeks and months to buy this clothing it wasn't cheap and and it because it was it was having a go at the system is like we are going to be better than you we're going to write we're going to wear the clothes you don't want us to wear so it was it was a big statement clothing was a statement and the whole music was a statement and when punk came along it, it, that was a next movement from it. So, and and punk was angry. Like I said, it was against the system. It was this broken system we were living in. Britain was fucked at that time. And punk came out of it. You know, when when um, Johnny Rotten wrote, you know, Anarchy in the UK, that meant something to us. It was like, we're going to have anarchy. We're going to break this once and for all, you know. Um, and so that was the anger we came out of. So you, you you've got to always think it's the political backdrop of the era um and so nothing stays the same and so as things have gone on now if you go right to now 2021 or whatever year we're in 22 um it's all social media you know so you look on you know the skinhead world as such is all on instagram you know and it's these young pretty girls wearing a skinhead outfit and some guy you know like oh look at me i'm a big tough skinhead on instagram they've never been to a fucking gig in their life never had a fight you know never met another skinhead but they're all captain cool on the fucking internet you know, this is a different generation. You can't sort of say it's wrong because it's now. They're never the, the working class doesn't exist anymore in England. The communities are gone. They've sold all the housing off. You know, housing now is a is 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 currency. You know, do you think that that's living. why? You yeah, think that's why uh, it's so much more popular in places like Indonesia and Mexico, and yeah. it because in a way those communities are like 30 years behind yeah, absolutely. a lot of the developing countries. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, exactly why. I mean, and when you go to Colombia, you know that, I mean, in Colombia, generally the skinheads there are quite middle-class as Colombians go because they, they've got to be able to afford the clothing. I mean, I mean, over there, the, the class system is massive. You know, you either have nothing or you have a lot. And then and the, generally the, the South American skinheads come from the work, the middle class in, um, in south america you know they work i mean most of them that i know work and you know shops and stuff like that but they come from you know you've got the you know the um the sort of shanty towns and stuff which is the lot and they've never even heard of skinheads they live in a you know recycling cardboard to live you know so and it's kind of like you need to be like you need to be like uh low enough in the class system to sort of feel oppressed but mm. high enough to sort of be able to afford the gear and appreciate the, the materialism <laughs> of it right exactly yeah exactly yeah. I, i've not been to mexico i've not seen the skinhead scene in mexico that's one one place i've not been yet and i'd like to go there 
Um, but I've, I mean, it looks I've, incredible. <laughs> like, well, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, you know, I work with Simmer and we're hoping to do a gig down there at some point. Um, I mean, I've been asked to go there a few times, you know, like they want me to go over there and, but I've said, well, you know, I'll come there at some point, <laughs> you know, maybe do some DJ or something or take a band that I work with over there or something. Cause I want to meet them because I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. I mean, I'm treated so well when I go around the world because of, probably because of Gavin's bit. You, you, you like just mentioned too. Simmer up. Um, yeah. You do you you do tour managing for them? Yeah, I manage them. Yeah, yeah, it's Pyramid Sue, yeah. the original Simmerip. Yeah, three of the original. Can you uh, can you just uh, explain quickly what uh, who they are? What they're well, about? they they basically um, they were the backing band for Prince Buster and Laurel Aitken in the early days. They came over to England in the early sixties and were the backing band called the Bees. Um, then they became pyramids and they had a couple of um, scar hits, early, early scar hits in the sort of mid 60s. Um, and then in 68 or nine, they were back in Laurel Aitken. And he said, oh, you know, because at that time they had a big skinhead following. And um, Laurel said to them, why don't you do some, you know, songs about the skinheads? Because they're the fans. So they wrote, they swapped their name backwards from pyramids and called it Simmerip. And they wrote an album called Skinhead Moonstomp. And um, and this was the first skinhead reggae album ever made. Um, and this These was are, uh, Jamaica, the genre. You know, they're from Jamaica, correct? They're from Jamaica, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so and and they uh, they asked me, um, I don't know when it was, maybe three or four years ago. Would I manage them and, and work with them? And uh, yeah, it was a massive honour. So I said, yeah, of course I will. You know, so I got them over to the skinhead reunion, which I run in um, in Brighton. So that's, and they your, went, that's your thing, the skin and reunion. Yeah. yeah, I've been doing that for twelve years, and I, you know, I, I do. I, I know it's my passion. It's my, it's my hobby, really. You know, and I, I do my best to sort of keep the scene alive, and I bring bands from all around the world, and I try to encourage everyone to come and attend it. And I always sort of say, you know, um, you know, like I've just said in this conversation, drop all the bollocks and just come along and have a good time. So everyone's welcome. You know, if you're a middle class skinhead from Scandinavia or the USA, you're welcome as much as a oik from up the east end you know what i mean we all mix and you know black white we don't give a shit you know we just come and have a good time yeah that um, was i was gonna know. ask you about about like yeah the scene there and how it's going and it seems like if you are able to keep that skinhead reunion going there is enough people around to, yeah. to support it i mean it's not massive i mean we we get you know i mean on, on a really good year we've had like five six seven hundred come on a That's bad year good about 300 but this year was quite bad because obviously we've had the pandemic for the last three years and we've managed to do it each each year amazingly but the numbers have been much smaller because and obviously now you've got the price of fuel and the price of hotels and the price of flight it's crazy so it it, it does that but it's sort of stable and, and i love it and i i get to see my friends every year and we all come down and have a good drink have a good laugh and we when's all just the, uh, and have a good time really yeah when's the next one up. uh well at the moment, I've got problems with the venue. They they norm it's normally the first weekend of June, and it's probably going to be the first weekend of June. But they got some sort of issue going on at the moment, so they've not given me the date. But it will probably be the first weekend of June next year. That's what the weekend we've used every year. Yeah, but there's lots of the thing is as as we've built it, and I mean I will take a bit of personal credit because 12 years ago there was hardly any skinheads in England. I started the reunion because a lot of my mates had done, I, I've been at a few funerals and. I was getting to see me old skinhead mates around around graveyards. And I said, we've got to get together. We've got to have a reunion. So I said, right, I'm going to do it for free on Brighton Beach. That's where I live now. Let's all get together and let's have a drink. And that was really all it was. And then the following year, some bands wanted to play and we had to get insurance and hire, you know, PAs and stuff like that. So I said, right, we'll have to charge a bit of money. Just we all chip in and we'll, we'll do an event. So we did that. And then it's just grown from there. And then bands want to come here and everyone wants pay in. So it, it's had to become a ticketed event, you know, which wasn't really the plan in the start at all. Um, you know, I've sell a few ticket T-shirts and stuff like that, but it's never been a profit making thing. And over the years, where, if ever there has been a profit, I, I tend to, you know, get a young band and try and manage them and get their record out and do what I can. I just put it back in and we raise money to for, for charities. You know, we do a few bits for military charities and, Various. And we had a girl last year. She had cancer. We rose money for her. And um, this year, you know, we every year we we we, we donate um, to a nice charity. It, it, often military ones, you know, with people with PTSD or wounded, blinded soldiers and things like that. Because a lot of skinheads, you know, went into the military, so it's very much related to you know where we come from. So I tend to I tend to do that if there's any profit. But 
it's usually whatever's made is just put back in and it pays another band's fees for next year or pays the security bill or the insurance or whatever. And I just do it because I enjoy it, you know. How, how, really much, is a, how much is a ticket? It varies. I mean, this year was 60 quid, um, which is pretty good because it's, it's three days, well, four days if you want to, because we do a, a beach barbecue on the Thursday, which we all just have a drink on the beach and, and um, have a barbecue and that's sort of free within your ticket. And then so we have three days for 60 quid, so 20 quid a day. Um, and it's for, you know, 14 hours a day so for 20 quid. So it's pretty good. You know, so I, you keep... have, uh, I, I have to ask, do you have any plant based options at that barbecue? Any, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a load of, yeah. I'm a vegetarian myself. Oh, no way. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I highly uh, recommend uh, check out some of my other videos if you're <laughs> interested in that subject. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. So that's cool that you do the reunion, man. Um, and so you're on Brighton Beach. Have you ever been to that store, uh, Veg Shoe, Vegetarian Shoes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's still there. Yeah. It's been there for years. That yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He, uh, really that place, yeah. He worldwide gets, uh, <laughs> known, yeah. He gets I a lot of the know. boots made at uh by Solivare. Uh Solivare makes yeah. a lot of those shoes. Oh do they? Uh, I like Solivare. Yeah. I've got um, I've got Solivare boots, yeah. Yeah, so I've had some uh I've done some like custom stuff through them. I had like a mm -hmm. few pairs of uh uh astronauts like vegan oh, yeah. astronauts yeah. made and now uh now solivair just produces them they actually have on their website they have the vegan astronaut boots um which which is pretty cool and like yeah. wow progress but uh yeah, yeah man well uh, i want to thank you so much for for coming on and and talking about all this stuff um I'm hope you know. Hopefully, I make it to the reunion one year. I'd love to check well, it out. Well, man. It should come. You know, yeah. it. It's, and I like I say, I like to see, you know, mm -hmm. people around the world, especially people like yourselves that are educated and and are looking at it from a different angle because it's it's important. And the media is never going to change. You know, I mean, they're still rattling on and still you know same old bullshit. Um, but you just have to accept that. And the thing is. You know, nobody came as became a skinner because they wanted to be accepted and liked. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We can just laugh at them. Whereas when we were younger, we get angry and try and destroy them. Now we just laugh at them. You know, because we're we're probably more. You know, I mean, all this sort of latest, you know, wokey stuff that we're all going through. You know, we were woke before woke began. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We mix with everybody because we were the real working class. So, you know we are what they want to be you know we're the real we come from the work we come from the streets and and, and our friends are our friends and i that's why i won't have none of that i won't have none of that flag waving and fucking labeling you know i hate all that because we are real we're real people and anyone that comes to the reunion anybody from any walk of life background come along they'll be welcomed as a friend really you know unless you take the piss then you get a smack on the nose you know what i mean but generally everybody's welcomed as a friend you know and that's how it is but you know yeah man i i hope i can make it next year if, as long yeah, as it doesn't yeah. cost as long as it doesn't cost like two grand for a round trip <laughs> ticket thing <laughs> the, the moment are insane i've got to get monty over from um he lives in um in uh oh where is it um atlanta and it's fucking crazy it's three times the cost of what it was last year three times yeah it's unbelievable insane. it's insane and Wait, that's do you ever think about like um traveling with it like doing some stuff like in like in in different countries doing a, a reunion i've been asked that a lot of times um but it's very difficult because you know you you see i i'm genuine right and i've got a lot of genuine history my history is easily found you know all them pictures gavin took my history is genuine but the problem i've got is that people around the world are coming at it from a different angle. So I've got to try and change their mindset to be able to do it. So like in Germany, for instance, you know, I go to Germany, I'm hated in, in an area of Germany because they're very, very left wing. And they think because I book of the odd oi band or because I've, you know, I've got a flag on my t-shirt or whatever, it makes me a right wing. I'm not at all. <laughs> my history is there, but these are people who don't know the history. So they're, they're, they come I mean, don't, don't the they, see, they ever seen the pictures of like you and Barry and like exactly the guys hanging out, you know? Well, Barry, I've known Barry since he was five years old. He, he lived in the, um, in the children's home next to my school, like an orphanage. And I was good friends with another black kid called Tony Mullet, who was a bit older than Barry. 
and I used to go around there and Barry was like the little kid in, in the, in the, um, in the children's home. And so I took him under my wing when he was five years old. And at the time I was probably about 10 years old, you know? Um, and so he's been my friend since then. And a lot of kids on my estate, they were all, you know, I was a bit of a bit of a lad around. So I used to look after a lot of the young ones. And, um, and then when Barry left the, the children's home when he was seven, 16 or whatever, he'd come and live with me. And we all lived in a Skinhead house together. That's how long I've known Barry. And, um, you can see in the pictures and stuff, but these people, they don't that see That was like me. what, the late 70s, early 80s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've known Barry. God, fuck me. If I go back in my age, you know, you're talking early 70s, I've known Barry from. And I know him, you know, to this day, he lives just around the corner from me now. So, what, and, do, um, what, do they, what would they say about, like, I, I don't, so when they're saying they don't like you because you wore a, a like the Union Jack or something? Yeah. No, what, what it a, is, what it is, it's so ridiculous, right? I am not an expert on every single band in the world, right? Especially not the Oi bands, right? Now, right. I don't know the history. I don't know nothing about them, right? I get recommendations. Oh, can this band play, right? So I look at them and I go, yeah, they're an Oi band from wherever. Yeah, they can play. And then the next thing you know, oh, well, they played with somebody five years ago oh, and right. they yeah, played yeah. a bloke and therefore you booked them, so therefore you're a Nazi. And I'm going, look, if this band want to play the Skinhead reunion, they are well aware we're not a Nazi right. event at all. So if you're a Nazi, why would you want to play an event that is certainly not a fucking Nazi event, right? But these people obsess and they, and they look at it. And, you know, there's that, that that whole thing of, um what do they call it? Um, degrees of separation. Right. right? Now, if you pick Marilyn Monroe, you could find a link how is you're... Five, to six Marilyn degrees. Monroe. Oh, I went five. down to you. Know, uh, yeah. Anyone, anyone. You can do that with, you know. Um, and so... I get connected because of some band somewhere, you know, who I have no idea about. I've never booked a, 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 an extreme right wing band. I won't book an extreme left wing band either because mm. they're at war with each other and they're causing friction. We're down the middle, you know, we're what, what's called traditional. You know, it's, it's interesting is um, I actually, so there's the band Condemned 84. Yeah. I, I actually, a lot of people don't, uh, don't, think so but i consider them an extreme right-wing band right yeah. um i mean they have they have written some songs that have that are purely hateful um right. but uh but what's funny is i, I admit it i my ska band like yeah it was like 13 years ago yeah. op opens for them mm. <laughs> and when we were trying to figure out if we should play that show because yeah. of like the stigma of, of that band the man the guy who was kind of helping manage us at the time was like well isn't it wouldn't it just be like funny anyway because our singer was is asian and yeah. i don't think that like that band's like racist i think yeah. that they're like homophobic and probably right wing in their politics i, I don't um, i don't really know to be honest i mean i but, i don't I, I, I just based on the songs that I've, I've heard. I, could, I, I right. don't think I could even name one of their songs, to be honest. Really? So, but really. it was, the idea, the thing was, it was, it was just funny. I guess yeah. the idea yeah. that if they, if, if they do even have those politics, why would they yes. want to be playing with someone with us? Well, exactly. Right? Exactly. So, I mean, they, they come from, they come from up in Norwich or Ipswich or somewhere, right. Which is up on the sort of Northeast coast. Right. It's very rural. It's sort of like, it's a little town that's on the coast and all around is miles and miles of farmland, right? They, they come from a very white area. Um, so if they were... I don't know. I, the only thing I would pin against that, I wouldn't pin racism against them. I would just say that they're, they're homophobic and, uh, and, and probably right-wing with their politics. That's only based on songs they've written. They may have changed their opinions and their beliefs. I remember back then I was like a super pothead and I went up to them and I'm like, oh, you guys want to smoke? And then he's like, well, we're, like, we don't fucking smoke. We're skinheads, aren't we? And I'm like, OK, I, I didn't know like you, skinheads aren't allowed to smoke weed. But uh, oh, no, there was a big there was a big anti drugs thing in the 80s. It was um, it was a big thing, although there were a lot of people doing drugs, especially in that circle. You know, they were with weed and whatever. But um, yeah, that was all part of that. I think um, I don't know. I, I think there's these sort of rules. It's all very, it's all very contradictive. The whole thing, really. Uh, I mean, 
Yeah, and, that's why. And, that, and that's kind of why I asked you about the yeah. sort of the authentication process. You know, yeah. like yeah. You know, I like to hear different people's takes on it. A lot of the yeah. the kids I hung out with. There was like some crews that didn't really care, but like the people I hung out with, there was super militant. You had the prospect, you had oh, to be man. hazed. Where are I, where are got, I got where hazed so bad, man. Not even as bad as a lot of kids, though. A lot of kids got there was some kids that got beaten. That was the whole thing. You had to get oh, yeah, the that. whole gang had to beat you up, right? Like that was a, <laughs> there was some crazy shit. But yeah, uh, yeah. you know, um, well, oh yeah, but at that show, that condemned eighty four show, which was like pretty, uh, it was a cool, it was a cool experience. Uh, but but what I didn't like was there obviously was like neo Nazi dudes that came and they put they put duct tape over their the their badges right. on their jackets because they <laughs> knew if you come to Boston, yeah, and you have any like white power mm -hmm. stuff. You would yeah. get you would get your ass kicked pretty quickly, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, so anyway, I, mean, I, I, <laughs> I think nowadays it's start like I don't know. It, it, it's all part of the whole dress up. It's the shock thing, isn't it? You know, I mean, what's his name? Sid Vicious wore a swastika. The Hell's Angels wore swastikas, and the skinhead sort of picked up on that. And I think some of these bands and some of these people, it's um. It's all sort of the shock value of it, and oh, look at us—we're the bad boys. But in real, real life, they're not like that. Um, I, I can't speak for them because I don't really know them personally. Um, and what about you know, like uh, you know, in, in the Gavin Watson books? Yeah, you see some of the some of those kids wearing uh, screwdriver T-shirts, right? Yeah. yeah. Now I'm not going to act like I never listened to that band. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I think a lot of people that got into the skinhead movement did uh mm. listen to some of their music um i certainly do not uh um promote uh their message or any of the albums that have really negative right wing uh they they were they were funded by a right wing party called the national front all right, right. the national front had policies and they had certain things that would recruit all right and in the 80s there was a lot of issues in england we had communism Right. We had the we were you got to think we still had the Berlin Wall then. There was a Cold War. Most of my brother was in the army in Germany. He had six seconds to live if there if a war broke out. He was a an advanced radar operator, right? So his job was to was to look for missiles coming over the wall. He had six seconds. He was one of the first to be knocked out, right? We had the IRA that the, there was a civil war in Northern Ireland. So you had the Protestants and the Catholics killing each other, right? So you had the IRA that were an enemy of England, of Britain, you know, they were terrorism. Right. You had what else did you have? CND. You know, you had the nuclear campaign. Right. So there were all these there was immigration. There was a lot of these different policies that they were recruiting using these different oh the, the fears. It's like, oh, you're, you're we're scared of the communists. Let's be anti-communist. We're scared of the IRA. So let's be anti-IRA. And so join us and, you, and we'll look after you. and We'll be anti this and anti that. Right. So screwdriver were funded by the national front and they wrote songs of the policies so all those songs you hear those early screwdriver songs they were all about those subjects you know um and like any you know music is a great way of um you know gaining a following and 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 sort of influencing young people's minds if you look at bob dylan for instance you know he was singing times are changing and a tambourine man and you know all those, you know, rebel, you know, those those rebellious songs in the sixties that were against the Vietnam War, and you know, Hendrix and and all these people were, were writing these these songs, these protest songs. You know, protest songs have gone. You know, Woody Guthrie. It's gone throughout history. The, the Irish folk songs, the Scottish folk songs. You know, it's gone throughout. And you punk when punk came along, it had a message. And you listen to the different punk bands, and you would listen to the message and start believing that message. So. The, the, the political movements and the parties knew that if you could get banned singing songs and it become popular, the young people are going to believe the words of those songs and go along with it. Look at rap now. Look at all the, um, you know, all, all the, all the grime and all the stuff like that. You know, rap, you know, it was, they were singing about, you know, bling and, you know, abusing women and all these different things that they were singing about. And of course, young kids who were into rap started following that and believing it and being in becoming drug dealers. And because that was what it was all cool, you know, 
and 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 it's very easy to manipulate a young a young person's mind by music. So therefore, these political parties, the left wing, did it as well as the right wing. You know, you had. Them- I, I guess the question is, yeah. what was the judgment like on, like from you and your peers of. I don't know. I'm. I'm not. I don't know if these people were your friends or not. Because I guess yeah. G- Gavin was just taking pictures. Yeah. You know, of many different people. But um, like for example, in Boston. Yeah. You know, you couldn't wear a screwdriver shirt. No. You, know, you just like you would not get away with it. I personally, <laughs> and, and nowadays, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't say yeah. anything to anyone. Uh, back then, I was trying to like uphold an image and wanted to act like i you know was gonna police shit or whatever which was just really unrealistic of me to even have that idea in my head um i was very arrogant um but but yeah i'm just saying that's how it was so i'm just wondering what the culture was like well in, uh, in, in the eight in the 80s right when screwdriver at their height they were a very small band they, they never played in more than front of about 500 people maximum right mm-hmm. they were a very very small obscure band most mm. people had never heard of them, and to this day, have still never heard of them, right? Yeah. So, as the years have gone on, and the media and the and the, and the internet's picked up, these people have become this sort of folk, you know, myth. And in the reality, <laughs> it was tiny. It was yeah. fucking tiny. So, if you wore a screwdriver shirt around, I never had one. I, I, you know, yeah. but if you wore a screwdriver shirt, no one would even know who the fuck it was. They wouldn't. Yeah. I tell you a true story, right? I tell you a true story. I was working on a TV series called Adrian Mole, the Grand pains of Adrian Mole. Right. And we were like a little skinhead gang and the, the lead character was a comedy show. Right. Uh, and, and it was like these kids and, and they basically, we were the skinhead gang to be Adrian Mole's bad boy gang. And we went into the wardrobe one day and she's got the clothes out that we got to wear. And she gave us a screwdriver t-shirt. And I said to the girl, do you know who that is? That, Oh no, it's a skinhead shirt. I said, you can't wear that T-shirt on the television, right? You imagine if I'd have worn that T-shirt, right? One, that the, the TV show would have probably ended up getting banned. And number two, for this to this day, <laughs> I'd be known as the bloke who wore a screwdriver T-shirt oh on the TV. You know, it was so, they were so obscure. No one knew who they were. It and was just a little T-shirt that now has got flags on it. it a little crew in so Germany would be the that. least of your worries, bro. And nobody, you know, honestly, it was... I know people are probably watch this and they go, "Oh, he's a cunt," you know. But let's be honest; it was tiny. It was tiny. You know, when Madness reformed, right? I think Screwdriver's biggest gig they ever did probably was no more than five. I don't know, five or six hundred people maximum, I would think. Right? When Screw, when um, Madness reformed in nineteen ninety two, they got forty thousand people. Oh my right? god! I had, you know, I'm so You've upset, got, man. I had, I had one tickets to see thousand. Madness. I had tickets to see Madness for, I think it was March of 2020. That show yeah. got canceled. They rescheduled it for the next year. It got canceled again, rescheduled it for the, they got canceled three years, three years in a row. And then they said, they're just not going to do it. And they never what, came to Boston. In, in, in Boston when was that, yeah. Was that recently? yeah, man, they, they, they had rescheduled two for like two years in a row and, and right. then they just decided to, to, uh, just, to cancel just the whole thing all together good friends of madness and some of them are a pro um the jab and others are very anti-jab so that's the problem okay. they've got they can't, they can't get through customs with, without the jab so that's probably part of Wait, the reason. they can't get so this is interesting because i actually did want to ask you about that yeah. uh not necessarily your opinion on the whole thing but just about how it's going over there so you're telling me they can't uh, the customs going into England or out of England? It's yeah, it's, well, it's both. I mean, travel wise, now I mean, I've traveled quite a lot, even within the pandemic, and you've pretty much got to have your jabs to go anywhere. You have to, you've got to have, yeah, you've got to have two, yeah. if not three. Like to go through Spain, you need three jabs, and you've got to have it proven on your on your phone, you know, your app and all that. Okay, well, so see, I wasn't. A, I've heard of that. Yeah. different restaurants are doing passports yeah. yeah but my understanding was you don't need to have the jab to go to various places you just need a quarantine or get a test or something it's, but you're it's, it's different in different countries i mean i've just been down to columbia at the beginning of the year and um we had to have the jabs to go two of them you you know um and then you 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 have an app so when you get on the plane you've got to show that then you go on to the next plane you've got to show it 
um, then there was certain certification you have to do um, going through Spain, which was a transit place. Um, and then in Colombia, they didn't seem too worried about it. But again, you've proven to get on that plane that you've had the jabs. So uh, they might be changing it slightly now, but generally you've got to have jabs. I, I'd, I think they'd be very, very difficult to travel without them anywhere. Could I get to England you know, without the jab? Better, eh? Could I get to England without the jab? I doubt it. I can't, I can't, I can't guarantee that, but I doubt it because there, there's so many hurdles. You've got to go through so many different checkpoints to get here. Um, I'm not sure what the ruling is at the moment, but I know from my experience this year that everywhere I went, I went to Greece um, on holiday and we had to have a test in a hotel uh, the day before we came back to England um, to prove that we were clean uh, of the virus. Um, then we had to do like a, a test again when we got to England. They've dropped a lot of them now, um, but I think they might have changed it. But as far as I, I know, you've still got to have proven that you've had the jabs everywhere you go. Yeah. So, okay. Well, that was some pretty interesting information you told me yeah. about madness, about the split, and that's probably why yeah. they couldn't make it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, it sounds like I'm not going anywhere because I'm not getting that <laughs> fucking thing for sure. No, a lot of people are anti and they won't get it. So, yeah. fair enough. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, again, like, I'm not hating on anyone who's gotten it. I just, yeah don't believe in a, a mandate for that sort of thing but yeah, um, a, lot of, a lot of my friends my friends are split down down the middle i mean i'm i've had the jabs but purely because i just want i need to travel and if i wasn't going traveling i wouldn't have had them you know as simple as that i i worked throughout the, the pandemic i've got i've had covid twice um you know and it is what it is i don't give a fuck really but mm -hmm. i mean i'm not sure there's a lot of theory about the jab i mean i've got a friend who's obsessively anti um anti jab and she um she thinks there's you know martians are landing and all sorts of stuff going on with it you know uh, and we're being you know monitored and god knows what you know there's all sorts of conspiracy well, theories. yeah i don't i, I don't want to poison yeah. the well too much i mean yeah. you know just because some one believes one crazy Thing that is completely outlandish doesn't mean the other conspiracies are, aren't well, real. You know, there's yeah. an element of truth in all this, but it just yeah. gets thrown out of all proportion. And yeah. then, but people more people who are more people. susceptible to yeah. crazier ideas will obviously jump on. It's the, like uh, anti-vax yeah, bandwagon. It's become it's become like a re religious in that you either believe it or you don't, right? And right. you can argue until the cows come home. What's right? What, who, who knows? The world's been shut down by it. Um, I don't know. I don't know the long-term impact of the jab. Who knows? You know, we've told this. Well, to talk. It is I, what it is. And, I think the most important thing you just said there was that it's religious, which I completely yeah. agree with. And I yeah, think that's yeah. the, the, the most honest way uh, to look at it. But, um, you yeah. know, on that note, um, it's been – over an hour i don't i don't want to uh keep you too much longer mm. overstay my my welcome with you here <laughs> but uh i we we delved into quite a bit and i i think we got uh on to a lot of the information that uh, i wanted to talk about in the series i'm hoping to talk to a few more uh people and um about this i want to get one or two original skinheads not that you're not original, but I mean, original 69, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. first wave and, and get uh, their perspectives. And um, yeah, man, well, I'm going to I'm trying to I want to try and book some shows over here. I'm in Florida right now. Yeah. I, I'm from the Boston area, but I'm in Florida right. and uh, it seems like this would be a cool place to do some stuff. But uh, so I might pick your brain a little bit. Uh, about that at some point but i also uh i have uh my own my own line of shirts right, right. Uh, and uh, i'll i want to send you some some stuff about that in case you, you see anything you like i'd love to send you something yeah, yeah all man right. good so all right well let's uh we'll be in touch thanks simon Cheers. all right no worries mate nice to see you Ta -da. so long bye